you, but you never really come over for an interview. Yeah, I did. I keep on waiting at the back of the queue and then I keep on getting ushered off. Because you've got... got you got to get to the front of the queue then. You know I don't like to push in, Eddie. But anyway, welcome. Thank you. Back in America. You cannot keep still. A bit tired this morning. Yeah. Absolutely honest with you. So it's, it's uh, where are we now? Nine, yeah. Nine. Nine thirty a.m. Philadelphia. Matty Lawless has stuck me in some strange room, and now I'm talking to you. First coffee of the day, but looking forward to it. I mean, we're <clears throat> we're really having a great run in America. I mean, Super El Matias in Puerto Rico against Paro, nine thousand there. Bam against Estrada, nine thousand there. Now Boots against um, Abenician, about twelve thirteen thousand. So, yeah, it's going really, really well. I think we're understanding the market. Obviously, we've got a great stable of fighters. We're making great fights, but just really enjoyable. And um, I'm excited. Sometimes we've done these homecomings. I mean, Matthias was a good example where it didn't actually work out. Regis Progray kind of un underperformed a little bit at home before the Haney fight. There is a lot of pressure, you know, and I think we'll see what Boots is made of. Sometimes I'm doing these interviews thinking, I just did one. I'm saying I think he's going to be pound for pound number one. And I think he's going to be a three division world champion. You know, and it's like it's a, it's a lot of pressure, yeah. especially when you're fighting Abenician, who's a big underdog, but he's a right handful as well. And you know, he's not going to. He's like, not going to lie down. Real under the pressure. He's not. He's going to do what he always does. So this is a big fight for Jerron Ennis. The flip side of that is a great performance can really make you a superstar. You know, so that's what, what is on the table on Saturday. Can I ask you, Eddie, because um, I remember when you were starting to do all of these fights in America, you re you know, you was branching out, going over there, not bringing American fighters to the UK. You were setting up basically a matchroom stable in America. I've just watched a, the recent conversation that you had with Coogan, which was at the Catterall Pro Grey press conference. And you was talking about still you know, be getting like the, the digs from like the American promoters. But don't you see that as a compliment though? Because if they're talking about it, you've got to yeah. be doing something, right? I think if I'm honest, I didn't really know what I was doing when I first started in America. Like, okay. You know, I, I knew how to promote. I knew how to sell. But it was pretty difficult because we came with a massive budget, but we came with a new platform and a new broadcaster that no one had ever heard of. So it's all very well people talking about the zone now. Everybody knows it. It's the home of boxing. The schedule's unbelievable. But imagine having those conversations about an app. We're actually apps. I mean, we're talking five years ago. So people, apps, you know, of course, there were Netflix. Netflix. There, and that was my line. Well, you know, Net, this is the Netflix of boxing, you know, and the Netflix of sport. People were like, you know, I sat down with Mikey Garcia. I flew in once. I think it was LA. And I met him in a hotel. And I was quite nervous because... I really needed to sign those kind of names. Okay. And uh, he was like, so what, what, what is it again? And it's like, it was called the zone D A Z N. And he's like, right. And like, this is a guy who's fighting on Showtime or Fox or, you know, and, and ESPN are trying to get him. And, and I'm going, yeah, honestly, like this app's going to be massive. Like in a few years, everybody's going to be watching boxing on their the world. And, and he's like, right. And we had to overpay those people to even be in those conversations. Like, people knew me, but only really seen me from the UK. So I probably underestimated how difficult it was going to be to get that buy-in. Because okay. then they would go back and they would speak to our Heyman or they'd speak to someone on it. And they'd go, you go, what? You're going to fight on an app? Seriously? Like, and now, of course, all PBC fights are on an app. And some of them shared on the zone as well. So I, I just thought that and believed that it would be the future, the way that the content is digested. And you know, it did take a long time. And it took a long time as well to understand the country and the fan base. You know, What's I the like, difference, Eddie? What is the difference between the UK and the US? I'm interested in every like every state has its own rules, right? And every city is very different. So to promote a show in Philadelphia, for example. It's completely different to promoting a show in San Diego. And Las Vegas is completely different to promoting a fight in San Diego. And then Dallas is completely different to promoting a fight in Chicago. And like, it's not like us. 
we're like, what works in London basically works in Manchester. Right? Correct. Not, yeah, we, we're Brits. We like the same thing. And different fighters. Like, I couldn't believe that you would take a fighter from their hometown. Like you would take Boots and you would headline him in L.A. Right. And no one from Philadelphia would travel because it's five and a half hours and expensive to get to the other side of the country. Why aren't people boxing people in their hometown? Like surely, you, and, and crowds weren't great back then. It actually took us a long while to start selling the tickets that we're selling now. That comes through sort of brand recognition of, of Matrim and us, but also the fighters that we're signing as well. And, you know, we've gone on to, you know, sell out Las Vegas many times, sell out Mexico, uh, Mexico, New York, Madison Square Garden. Yep. Philadelphia is an extension of that, you know, and and tech number of events in Texas as well. And this is one of the biggest crowds, you know, San Francisco for Haney Pro Great. But this is one of the biggest crowds. This is one of the most rewarding little ventures because when we sign boots, everyone like there was no one who didn't say, "Bloody hell, he's he's the it, real deal." He went viral that signing. Oh, no one knows who he is. He's never sold tickets. He's this. He's that. And I'll be honest with you, when I went on sale, I didn't know we we'd do what we, we've done. You just hope, you know, I believe Philadelphia, good promotion, six, 7,000 would be nice. You know, now we're looking at double that. And I think that it's, it's right there for him. If he can produce something special on Saturday, then, you know, it's, it's, it's the sky's the limit. Hence the pressure. How does, you know, when you speak to the fighters, like, you know, you've obviously been speaking to Boots this week or you will be speaking to him. How does a fighter like him deal with that kind of pressure? Because you're doing his very first homecoming. Mm. That pressure is on him. Like you said, tickets have doubled. There's a lot of people that are going to be there. All eyes are on him. He's going in with a better opponent, which is obviously David Avanesian. We, like you said, he's not going to come and lie down. How does he react to that? Yeah, I don't know. I think um, one, one thing I miss a little bit is the relationships with the fighters as you become bigger and bigger. Do you know what I mean? Like... When you first start out, you've got like a handful of fighters. And when you're in a massive night and you speak to them every day and like you're there in every interview, every changing room, every media event. And obviously now we've got so many fighters that mm. we, we don't have that relationship with everyone. We have good relationships with everyone. So you have to manage that accordingly. Like the last thing I want to do is go into a changing room and start going, right, man, let me tell you something. Like just get like giving them a pep talk. Because sometimes I think, the fight must think. I mean, I get told after the fact that people go, that's really good, like the way you came in and, you know. But also, I don't want to be that cringe guy that hasn't got that relate that sort of... And the cameras are everywhere, actually. Oh, I mean, so I don't want to also just look like... Right. Because they follow me everywhere. So when I come in, I come in with the cameras. Okay. And I don't want it to be... I want it to be authentic to the point where it's like, you know, some little conversations you have can change the way a fight goes. And if I can have that influence, great. Ray Ford, I think, was a good example when he fought Komatov. You know, we were in the, on a way soil, if you like, on a top-ranked show. The team were quite quiet, you know, and I was sort of in the change room going, right, fucking, let's go. You know, and, and saying to him, like, numerous occasions, mate, you have to understand, you know, he's got his door over there. Like, you've got 36 minutes here to change your life. Like, you have to do whatever it takes. And those conversations, and maybe the way that he pulled that fight out for, with 12 seconds to go, maybe, maybe not. Those li little moments can help, you know, get a fighter over the line. And I think sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I forget that I've got 35 years experience in the sport, like being, a, being really up close around it. Sometimes I still feel like a little bit of a little kid who, I don't know, like, so. Is that a good thing, though? Isn't that what I keeps the fire always, in your belly? I think with Frank Warren, he said, you know, one of the things that I actually was most surprised about was how much he knew about boxing. I think people kind of forget, because I'm a little bit Jack the Lad and a little bit of a, a little bit wee, a little bit whoa, a little bit of a blacker. It's like, yeah, but does he really know boxing? It's like, I really do. I really do. You know, I know styles, I know tactics, I know fighters, I know records, I know history, I know like mindset, I know nutrition, I, I know everything. 
But I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. I don't, I don't like to get too involved. All right. But I love it at the same time. And and I think with boots, when I go back to the basis of my answer, which is dragged on a little bit now, which is really relationships with fighters. So with boots, I've got a new relationship. You know, I've met the guy four or five times in my life. So it's not like you know, we can go out for dinner and chat for hours and hours. Well, we can, but it's just not, we're not there yet. And some fighters like that relationship, some fighters don't. But on Saturday, it will just be a case of, you know, probably a, a couple of visits to the change room to say, listen, mate, it's all there for you. I've just been out there. You know, a fighter will always go, Johnny Fisher did it on Saturday. What's it like out there? Really? Oh, That's go, interesting. Absolutely mental. All right. Mental. And they're like, is it? Is it? You know, and he says, yeah, it is, mate. And guess what? They're all here for you. So wow. off you go. You know, and that's it's, it's, a, it's the greatest sport in the world in that respect because you're not walking out to go and have a game of football or a game of tennis or a round of golf. You're going you're out on to your fight. own. You're going yeah. out to fight another man. And it's it's wild, really. But that's when you get that energy. And it'll be wild in Philadelphia on Saturday. Like I saw that from the press conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's... Last night, Everlast were doing a shoot and we were down like at Front Street Gym and Mickey's Gym, which was the old Mickey's Gym from Rocky, right? And like the Italian markets where Rocky ran through when he came out of his house. And it was like a film set, but it's a proper, proper city, you know, like it's going to be lively. You can imagine that, yeah, the atmosphere will be wild. Well, I'll definitely be tuning into that, but you move from 36 minutes We've got to talk about 36 seconds. Not a soul solid 21 seconds, but yeah. 36 seconds, Eddie. Uh, my eyes were on stalks. Mm. Talk to us about that. I think that people, I just, there, yeah. there's a lot of talk at the moment, isn't there, about yeah, there is. fighting styles and who's exciting, who's not exciting. Some fighters are quite technical and defensive. And, you know, there's like the big, the big, um, Shakur debate, if you like, you know, and yeah, but when that happens on Saturday, it just lights everything up, right? So there's nothing like an explosive, fast knockout, especially when you're talking about what was it like a six punch combination of them. Like, and when you when you watch the viral clips back of our guys on the apron, the yeah, thud, you know, it's like thud, 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 bob, bob, and then everyone. And that, you know, that, those kind of clips go viral and there's nothing like a big knockout, you know. And um, Johnny's becoming really exciting. He impresses me in a lot of different ways, to be honest with you. Like, not just the way he's learnt and the way he's really given everything to the sport, but he's a, he's a smart guy, the way he handles his business as well. Like, it's impressed me a lot since the fire the way that he's been in conversations, plan the next one. I mean, obviously now he's fighting August 24th. Congrats on that one. Yeah. And I've said to him before, you've got to get more active. You know, you're knocking people out in the first round. People sometimes don't realise it's a, it's a nine-week training camp. It's a lot of work. So it's not just the 36 seconds, whatever it was. It's all of those works. So now he has like 10 days off and then he'll go back into camp. And he's really exciting. Really exciting. Almost one against the head. I mean, I've got to give my mate Sam Jones some credit because he told me before he turned pro, you know, look, this guy's been sparring with um, Joe Joyce. He's got virtually no boxing pedigree. I think he's had two amateur fights, but he's saying about him, like he's really excited, okay. punches really hard, unbelievable chin, strong. I think he'll be really well supported. I mean, Sam has given me 30 fighters and not, all of them make it. But this was one, you know, as he reminded me yesterday, hey, don't forget, I'll pick this one out, you know, and I'm excited to see how far he can go. I think I think if he doesn't win British and Commonwealth European titles, I think at this stage, I think he's underperformed. Now it's just a case of can he go and box at world level? And he's got some tough fights to get through. Fabio, Fraser, Adelaide, Allen, like they're all, they're all tough fights, but... He's young and he's fresh and he's he's dangerous, very dangerous. What I like about what you've done there is like there was the buzz of the knockout and it was like literally Johnny Fisher can take on the yeah. world. I get it. I was buzzing with you as well. 
But then it's like you've kind of like regrouped and you've said, you know what, he can do this, but why do we need to rush him? Because sometimes we see these fighters with all this potential that rush into fights and then, the, you know, they can fall foul. You've still got to build him. And I see that's exactly what you said you yeah. want to do. So when you move to, oh, sorry. No, you need rounds, you know, I think. Like, yeah. I, after the Fabio Fraser Clark fight, I texted him. I said, I honestly believe you beat both. Really? And like, yeah. And he's like, I do, but I just, you know, I need, I need that experience. I need, and Saturday actually bought a lot of that experience in terms of the build up, headlining, all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's just the fight you know, didn't build the experience because it was 36 seconds. But there was still a lot that he would have learned from the whole occasion. So now on the Catrell Pro Grey card, mm. you need someone that could take you rounds. Six, seven, eight, ten rounds. Because when you fight Fabio or you fight Fraser or these guys, then it's unlikely that it's going to go oh, be over, you know, in the first or second round. These are very tough men, tough fights. And you've got to be ready. You've got to be, you know, like when AJ went in with Dillian White, one of the problems was he'd never gone past four or five rounds. And, you know, kept we brought in Kevin Johnson. He was the guy that took everybody 10 rounds, one round. You know, fought um, Gary Cornish for the Commonwealth, one round. Like, and then you go and fight Dillian White. And before you know it, you're five, six rounds into an absolute back and forth. Ooh. And you've never been there before. And you have to come through it, you know, or, or not. And that, that's, you'd always prefer to have a couple of those moments that prepare you for that, for that moment. But when you're knocking everyone out, it's very difficult to do. How long do you think it will take before you give us uh, the nod on who we'll be going in with? Because we've just recently seen that Adelaide's pulled out or yeah, injured. Because I think Adelaide is a headline fight. I mean, we could do, I mean, we, could, you know, we only had about a thousand to go on the copper box on Saturday before it was all full up. So Fisher... Adelaide, 100% sells out uh, Copper Box. Fisher Dakers sells out Copper Box. Fisher Allen sells out Copper Box. The way that I see it is August 24th, you know, a, a strong, durable opponent. All right. I want to take him to Australia. For the par roll. Huge fan base over there, remarkably, him and his dad, um, for the paro card, which would probably be November. And then I want to headline him back at the Copper Bosch on February or March. And that will be Adelaide, Dakers, Allen, if he got a couple of good wins. I think, that, you know, I love Dave Allen. And he's, he's, a, he's a strong man, but I, he needs to get a couple of good wins before, before that, which I think he'll do as well, actually. And then once you come through that, then you're looking at Clark Wardley. Okay. Because that's the natural step. And, and that's a fight that sells out the O2, no doubt about it. You know, so it's exciting. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions because I know you are obviously a very busy man. I've got to go to the September the 21st card and I'm not going to touch on the headline because everyone speaks to you about that. I spoke with uh, Joshua Bowatsi. Um, obviously, he's on the card as well. We've got now the, the boxer input with Tyler Denny. I asked Joshua, what was it like? You know, you were with Eddie Hearn. He was your you know, your promoter, and then you sat there in front of him. What was it like? Was it like bumping into an old ex? So I've got to put the, the question back. He, he, he just laughed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. just laughed. He, he did. He burst out laughing. Um, but but what was it like for you? Because obviously this is the first kind of like interaction we've seen now with yourself and Boxer working together. A little bit about that, um, Eddie. Yeah, I think that there's so much going on in our world, in our business, yeah. those kind of moments aren't as big a deal as they might have been five or six years ago. I mean, I, I, I never like to sit there and look at a Coley and Waxy and go, ha ha, look what happened, you know. But the, the truth is it's in front of you. Both guys' careers since they left Matchroom, one hasn't gone anywhere, and that's Joshua Waxy. I mean, when he was with us, he was basically number one in the world. He was been offered a shot against Bivol. The world championship was right in front of him. And that was like two and a half years ago. He boxed in Birmingham, I think, in some irrelevant fight. Then he boxed Aziz, which is like for the British title. What you said was going to happen, yeah. I think that's it. Two fights in, in two years, really. So 
Now he's fighting Willie Hutchinson, who, with all due respect, is also a British level guy. Like now, whether Willie can go on and become a world level guy, great. But he beat Craig Richards, who is again good British light heavyweight. Well, actually beat Craig Richards, and the, you know, so I don't really think that Boatsy has done much in that two-year period. And I think he's a great fighter. Akoli obviously came out, defended his title in Manchester, I think he was, and then got beat. They sent him away to get beat. So, and, you know, it was expensive for, for Akoli, and there's still legal action going on with Boatsy, which needs to be resolved. So, um that all sat there and sort of like all of that going on in the background, or is it just... Uh, yeah, I don't... I mean, I don't... You know, fighters generally have good hearts, right? They're, they're good people. It's just they just get bad advice. Mm. So Boatsy got terrible advice, so did Akoli, and they went with that advice. And instead of going and listening to the people that actually cared about them and had them from the get-go, the debut. But that's how boxing works. You know, there's a lot of people who steal a living, who manage and represent fighters who have absolutely no idea what they're doing, what they're talking about, no idea about boxing. So, but when this, this goes back to relationships, Ad, yeah. when you're, when they're around them all the time, right? So they're messaging them all the time. They're speaking to them every night. And it's just after a Roomy. while. Grooming? Yeah, grooming there. I mean, I, I think that it's more like after a while, you lean on that person, you lean on that trust. And, and they they seep their way into your emotional you know, dependent soul to for you to trust them and believe them and it's like <laughs> how are you listening to this person? Like that's how I feel about it. But but maybe but actually felt like and that's a problem of becoming big. Yeah. Is that maybe you feel like you're not number one priority and he wasn't because I always felt like he never really listened in terms of the activity and and how I wanted to move him. Um, and also we've got a lot of fighters and, and unfortunately when you got stable, like we've got one mediocre performance just takes you back a little bit in terms of not the pecking order, but like, I get it. right. So right now, this week has been about Johnny Fisher, right? Yeah. Oh, this guy's sold out a couple of, like the ratings were amazing. Oh, let's do this, do this, do this versus a performance from, I don't know, um, someone else recently, which might not have been as good. And it's, it's not like, oh, forget about them. It's just like, okay, what's next for them? Yeah, great. So that's just, fighters have got to understand that as well. Yeah. That, and it's the same with Boots. You know, if Boots goes out this weekend and don't look great, and this, I'm thinking. He will. He will, but it's like, okay, now, if he goes out and looks sensational, the whole of social media is talking about him, the whole of the world's talking about him, I'm Correct. doing press conferences next week. We're planning his next shows. I'm speaking to his excellency. I'm, you know, and, and that, that's just how it goes. So, yeah. um, no, luckily it's not a one man band with me. I know I'm the, the mouth, but we've got, you know, 40, 50 employees that are moving fighters that are thinking, that are planning events and schedules. And, and you know, I think um, we're in a really good place. Like the zone's in a really good place as well. The numbers are fantastic in the US and the UK. Obviously, the Riyadh season events have been helping them a lot, coming off the back of, you know, Usyk, uh, Joshua against Agano, Usyk, Fury, you know, all these huge events. So, yeah, we're, we're boxing's in a good place. And finally, from me, before I let you go, uh, Chris Eubank Jr. has recently, it's been announced today, that he's signed with Boxer. And I, I get it, we've got all of this collaborative working now. There was some mention, obviously, Eubank Jr. fighting Canelo. Canelo, I know, is a supporter of yourself, as you are of him. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, we spoke, I mean, not myself, but Frank Smith had a couple of conversations with them. Oh, um, he would do, wouldn't he? Yeah. yeah, I think... Uh, I don't know how they described it, a partnership rather than a promotional deal. So I'm not really sure what that partnership is, but he wanted two gimme fights quickly because he's been very inactive. Correct. We didn't want to give him those two gimme fights. We, we said, we'll give you one, but he wanted two sort of give me fights, you know, like easy fights. And I, I get it. Um, and they just messaged us and said, look, we're going to do these two fights. We still want to make the Conor Ben fight. So okay. we'll keep that conversation open, but, you know, I, I don't know about the Canelo fight. 
I don't know how real that. I, I don't think that fight's happening. But listen, who knows? So I would expect to see him back August, September in in a run out, and then probably another one in November, December, and you know, maybe we'll look at the Conor Ben fight. But only, of course, once we know a definitive date as to when he can return to the ring. Yeah, fair enough. Listen, Eddie, I know I could talk to you forever, but you are a busy man. I look forward. To, I literally, I'm going to hunt you down then. Fight week for the really? 24th of God, August. I know. Oh, I just feel bad because I'm not, I know. He's got a bit of a soft spot for you. Oh. I mean, he, say, he says, uh, you know, you course, though, Eddie? I'm doing all this Jerron Ennis media, all this American media, and I just see October Red stuffed in the middle. And I said, all right, Matt. He said, yeah, we missed out last week. So I promised her 10, 15 minutes. So I was like, all right, okay. So Matt, he's a big fan of yours as well. And I'm a big fan of Matty. But if you've got a soft spot for me as well, Eddie. Have you got a soft spot as well for me, Eddie? Yeah, I like your questions. Because when I do like uh, 30 interviews a day, it's like Brian Garcia, Devin Haney, AJ Dubois, Canelo. Because they know that like this market, this YouTube market, Becoming really interesting. I mean, it's so flooded that some of the big boys, their numbers are dropping off because others are coming in. And, you know, it means that you don't get as many major views, but you get a more consistent view across right. the platforms. Usually yeah. be like IFL, you know, and then like boxing social. And then, you know, but now it's just it's everything sort of just gone. Leveling out. A lot of, yeah, so it's very competitive. And for me, it's difficult because when now we do a presser, there are at I'll least a dozen YouTube outlets. And I know everyone spent their money to come and, you know, but also we have to start thinking about it commercially and say, like, if someone's doing a thousand views for one of my interviews and I can do 60 or 70,000 on IFL and then match and box in YouTube, but that's when I try and get everyone in a huddle at the end. So at least you get something. But listen, it's dog eat dog out there. So you've got to be different with the questions, I think. I mean, I think if you're a smaller outlet, there's no value in just asking the same questions all the, as everybody else. Mm. Because I think the interview style has got to be different. And I think you do that well. Well, thank you. That's a positive note to end on. Lisa, like I said, I will be chasing you down with the camera and the mic on Fight Week. Yeah, All the best for this week. Keep on pushing against the grain. And remember, if people are really insulting you, it's because you're doing a lot better than them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think yeah, that's well, the way I'm going to leave well. it on. All yeah. right. Catch Take you soon. care. Take care. People say I'm toxic, and honestly, I don't care.